August 22, 1979. Michael Ozzie Myers, a Democratic congressman from Pennsylvania, is meeting with representatives from Abdul Enterprises Limited. As agreed upon, Myers is handed an envelope containing $50,000 in exchange for his promise to introduce immigration legislation to the House of Representatives. The employees have a little secret, however. The company they work for isn't real. No, they aren't just common scammers. They're agents for the FBI. Congressman Myers has just destroyed his political career and he won't be alone. When the dust settles, one senator, six congressmen, a mayor, three city council members, several crooked lawyers, and an inspector for the INS will be thrown into prison for their connections to Operation Abscam, the FBI's most successful corruption sting. Our story begins with a con artist named Mel Weinberg. He gets caught, well, conning people, and is arrested in the 1960s. He's been working as an informant for years, but he's fired in 1976 for committing numerous felonies while working for the FBI. Apparently, he's been scamming for a while, and because he can't do that, he's arrested in New York on January 11th, 1978 by Special Agent John McCarthy. He's released and sent to Pittsburgh, where he's charged with 10 counts and is arrested. He's released from Pittsburgh, goes to Florida, and is arrested AGAIN for scamming people. He's obviously in quite a bit of trouble. Luckily for him, Agent Myron Fuller of the FBI is conducting an investigation into white-collar crime in New York City. The feds offer to help him with his legal issues if he helps them catch criminals. He accepts. Weinberg has quite a bit of notoriety in the criminal underworld, which means he has a lot of contacts. The local FBI field office creates Operation Abscam, named after contraction of Arab and Scam. As part of the operation, agents begin posing as representatives for Arab sheiks who want to invest money into illegal assets in the U.S. Weinberg introduces these agents to criminals, they make their deals, the criminals go to jail, and the process repeats. They're doing pretty good so far. Even with the help of Weinberg, it probably sounds a little weird for Arab sheiks to be sending people around to buy stuff. A little credibility would be helpful. In March, they decide to create a fake company built around the sheik store they already have, and boy does it work. Before I continue, I want to give a special thank you to Abdul Enterprises Limited for sponsoring this video. Are you involved with the criminal underworld? Do you like money? Well, Abdul Enterprises, proudly owned by two powerful Arab sheiks, is looking to invest in the United States. They're willing to buy and sell stolen artwork, counterfeit stocks, false securities, and so much more. They may even fund an illicit business venture of yours. Notable con man Mel Weinberg is a loyal partner of the company, so you can be sure that Abdul Enterprises is legitimately illegitimate. If making a deal with the sheiks sounds desirable, you can contact Abdul Enterprises at 1-800-GOTCHA. Make sure to let them know your full legal name and tell them explicitly what you are proposing. Remember, all business inquiries must be illegal. Did you fall for that? I, uh, I sure hope you didn't. You should already know by now that this company is actually owned by the FBI. Unfortunately for the criminal underworld, they don't have access to these type of videos and have no idea that they're about to be scammed. Ab-scammed. All operations at the time could be conducted with just the approval of the local field office as long as they were going to be shorter than six months and cheaper than $1,000. If an operation did not meet those two requirements, FBI HQ had to approve it. These guys are bouncing all around the country, from Miami to New York to Las Vegas. They're everywhere. Nobody can escape Abdul. Their operation has been fairly successful thus far, so in June, the FBI allows them to continue their operation until January 25th, 1979, and grants them a budget of $30,000. They won't let this go to waste. The FBI agents employed at Abdul Enterprises are going absolutely insane. They're catching criminals both big and small all the time and are seizing hundreds of millions of dollars worth of false securities, counterfeit stocks, stolen paintings, artifacts, and even a few illegally downloaded cars. On October 5th, the FBI raises their budget to $40,000. On October 10th, a man named John Stowe begins calling Weinberg and they talk about business. This is nice, just another man wanting to engage in crime with Abdul Enterprises. Pretty routine, right? Well, on October 17th, he says on a call that he has a congressman friend who's as big a crook as he is. What? D did he just say that he personally knows a member of Congress who's corrupt? That's, uh, awfully interesting, but this guy's actively trying to purchase false securities, so what he says should probably be taken with a pound of salt. On November 16th, William Rosenberg, who has been doing business with Abdul Enterprises for a while, pulls up to Abdul HQ with his partner, William Eden. They begin a conversation with Weinberg and McCarthy. During the conversation, Eden tells the two about all the messed up stuff he's done with Angelo Arichetti, the mayor of Camden, New Jersey. He talks about how much influence Arichetti has in Atlantic City and how corrupt he is. This is certainly interesting to the agents who ask to meet him. Both of the Williams agree, and John Good, one of the guys working on Abscam, asks FBI HQ for any information they have on Arichetti. 
On December 1st, Eden, Rosenberg, and Eric Chetty arrive at Abdul HQ to talk with McCarthy and Weinberg. The agents tell them that the company wants to open a hotel in Atlantic City and ask what it'll take to make sure that the government doesn't slow the project down. Arichetti just tells them to talk with his two pals and leaves. While he's gone, they say that it'll probably cost Abdul Enterprises $350,000 to $400,000 for his services. $400,000 is around $1.8 million in today's money, so he's quite an expensive friend for the Sheiks to have. The Sheiks apparently also want to open a casino in Atlantic City, and later Arichetti agrees to give them a license for one in exchange for $400,000 with a $25,000 down payment. This is significant, and John Good messages FBI HQ and asks for permission to give Arichetti the modern equivalent of $113,000. This request is approved. FBI HQ has recovered some interesting information on Mayor Arichetti. Apparently, he was indicted in 1977 for bid rigging but was acquitted. Naughty fella. Arichetti calls up his pal Harrison Williams, a Democratic senator from New Jersey. He lets him know that there are wealthy Arabs who want to spend a whole lot of money. Senator Williams calls Alexander Feinberg, an attorney from New Jersey, and tells him to look into this. Feinberg then calls Arichetti and lets him know that Harrison Williams and Henry Sandy Williams III, who I'll call Sandy for the sake of clarity, are interested in a titanium mine in Virginia and want the Arabs to fund it. On January 10, 1979, McCarthy meets with Arichetti, and during the conversation, Arichetti refers to Feinberg as Harrison's bag man. McCarthy is intrigued and asks to be introduced. Arichetti agrees. The following day, Weinberg, McCarthy, Arichetti, Feinberg, and Sandy meet. Feinberg says that Sandy and Harrison are very close and that Harrison wants the mine venture to succeed. Luckily for them, Abdul Enterprises also wants the titanium mine to be successful. A few days later, Arichetti tells McCarthy that Harrison is happy that the Sheiks are willing to invest in the mine. On February 26, the FBI officially declares that Operation Abscam has shifted to an investigation into political corruption. They extend the operation to September 30th and raise the budget to $50,000. Unfortunately, Arichetti can't just wave a magic wand and get Abdul Enterprises a license immediately. They need some extra help, so Arichetti and McCarthy agree on a plan to get Kenneth McDonald, the vice chairman of the New Jersey Casino Control Commission, on board. George Katz, a shady businessman, is pretty interested in the titanium venture. On March 13th, he meets with three undercover agents and some random guy that doesn't matter, and the five of them inspect the titanium mine that they want. On March 23rd, Abdul Enterprises hosts a party on the left hand, a yacht that the FBI stole from someone they caught. The party is being held in honor of Angelo Arichetti, a fact which he's very proud of. The whole gang shows up. One of the sheiks is there, and Harrison takes a picture with him. At the party, both McCarthy and Weinberg voice their concern about working with George Katz because the shady businessman has a reputation for conducting business in a shady manner. Harrison defends him. Feinberg and Harrison talk with Weinberg and McCarthy on the boat about how Harrison needs to keep his relationship with the mine a secret. At another part of the ship, Alexander Alexandro, an inspector for the INS, tells agents that he can help the sheiks immigrate to the U.S., for a price, of course. This guy isn't important, so I'll just spoil his story now. He ended up taking a $15,000 bribe for promising to expedite the immigration process for the sheiks. Yeah, he, uh, he went to prison. On March 30th, Arichetti hands Weinberg a handwritten list of public officials who he believes would take bribes. One of the names on there is Michael Ozzie Myers, a Democratic congressman from Pennsylvania. It's time for McCarthy and Arichetti to make their move on McDonald. On March 31st, McDonald and Arichetti come to Abdul Enterprises. When the two walk into McCarthy's office, McDonald immediately sprints over to the window and stares outside. McCarthy repeatedly talks about money, how he hopes McDonald can help, and even opens up a briefcase to show him the $100,000 he has ready to pay him. McDonald ignores all of this. Arichetti and McDonald leave, but first, Arichetti assures McCarthy that their meeting was a success. Staying true to the plan they created, it's now time for Arichetti to hand the bribe to McDonald in the parking lot while McCarthy watches from the window. Except, Arichetti doesn't do this. Instead of giving McDonald the briefcase, he just walks off with it. McDonald did not give any assurance that he would help Abdul Enterprises, nor did he receive a bribe, and now the FBI is pointlessly down $100,000. Oh boy, uh, <laughs> immediately after the meeting, McDonald and Arichetti are driven to a Holiday Inn, where they meet with Weinberg and Agent Amoroso, a new character. McDonald is pretty mad and rants about McCarthy's behavior in the middle of a Holiday Inn coffee shop, saying that it seemed like the agent was trying to entrap him. Did McDonald receive the bribe from Arichetti in secret? I don't know. 
The Senate committee put together to look into Abscam didn't know either, but they concluded that he knew what the meeting at Abdul HQ was for. McDonald died before he could be convicted of anything, so he's innocent until proven guilty, I guess. McCarthy decides to hand his undercover role as president of Abdul Enterprises to Ancient Amoroso. This is where we say goodbye to McCarthy. On April 18th, John Stowe reveals the name of his congressman friend to Weinberg. It's John Jenrette, a Democrat from South Carolina. All right, maybe what he's saying carries some weight. The Miami field office asks FBI HQ for any information they have on John Jenrette. Turns out, just like Arachetti, Jenrette already has a file on him. Both he and Stowe were allegedly involved in bank fraud and embezzlement in 1971, but were never prosecuted. On May 23rd, George Katz mentions George, Schwar Sch George Schwartz's name. He's the president of the Philadelphia City Council. It's 1979, so the Cold War is still on. Neither side looks like it's going to fold yet. To get an edge over the Soviets, Uncle Sam wants submarines. You know what you need to build submarines? Titanium. If only Abdul Enterprises and the several other men involved in the mine project had a friend in the government who could help them. Oh wait, yeah, they, they do. On May 31st, Harrison agrees to get government titanium contracts in exchange for 20% of the company. Everyone in attendance at the meeting agrees that Harrison needs to have his involvement concealed. On June 8th, Feinberg tells Weinberg that he'll register Harrison's shares under a different name. Later, Weinberg tells him to write down what each man will do for his share of the company and send it to the Sheik. Feinberg refuses to put Harrison's involvement in writing. In an attempt to appease Weinberg, he still writes a letter, but it doesn't say a whole lot. Weinberg is less than satisfied, and he complains about this to Amoroso, Katz, Sandy, and Arichetti. Amoroso suggests that Harrison should just meet the Sheik in person and tell him what he'll do. Everyone agrees that this is a good idea. Absolutely ravenous for the doubloons he'll earn from the mine, Arichetti meets with Harrison and demands that he guarantee the Sheik he'll get the government contracts. On June 28th, before the meeting, Arichetti and Weinberg coach Harrison. Weinberg tells him to, quote, come on strong. The meeting commences and ends, and Harrison walks out feeling triumphant. In early July, Louis Johansson, a Philadelphia city councilman, is playing golf with a neighbor of Arichetti's. The neighbor tells Louis about how Arichetti has connections with wealthy Arab sheiks. Louis immediately tells his business partner, Howard Cryden, about this. Both of them partially own a Philadelphia law firm called Cryden, Johansson, Dolan, Morrissey, and Cook. Cryden is interested in this opportunity, and a meeting is set up between him, Johansson, and Arichetti. After the meeting, Cryden returns to his law firm with exciting news. The Arabs want to buy friends in the government, and anybody who brings politicians to Abdul Enterprises will get a cut of the bribe. Howard Cryden, Louis Johansson, and Ellis Cook, all law partners, are in. While sailing on the left hand, Arichetti name drops Raymond Lederer, a Democratic congressman from Pennsylvania. On August 5th, Weinberg, Amoroso, and Arichetti meet with Senator Harrison in a hotel room at the JFK airport. They hand him his stock certificates, and Weinberg lets him know that another company will be ready to buy their mine. The men will get a loan of $100 million from Abdul Enterprises, and then sell it to new buyers for a $50 million profit. Now, obviously, the FBI doesn't really have $100 million to spend at the moment, so this story is just to buy time. Weinberg also says that he wants more than a $50 million profit and will negotiate for more. Harrison is later told that he'll earn $12.6 million from the resale. Alright, so the FBI has the names of three congressmen, Michael Lazi Myers, John Jenrette, and Raymond Lederer. Why would the Sheiks want to bribe them if they already have Senator Harrison promising to make them money? They create a new story for their operation. Iran just overthrew their government, so the sheiks are nervous that a revolution might come to their country in which they'd be killed. Because of this, the sheiks want to make sure that they have friends in Congress that will help them get into the United States where they would be safe. Politicians who take bribes would be expected to introduce private bills to help the sheiks get into the country. August 22nd. Here we go, the first congressman. Myers, Arichetti, Weinberg, and Amoroso meet in a hotel room at the JFK airport. They discuss the immigration issue, and luckily for the sheiks, Myers can do a lot for them. He rants for 35 minutes about everything he can do on behalf of the sheiks in the House of Representatives. He also assures the agents that, quote, money talks and bullshit walks. Myers also recommends that the sheiks invest in his district. This would be to conceal his true motives. He can just say that he wants the sheiks to come to the U.S. because they've created a bunch of jobs. A deal is eventually cut. Myers will receive $50,000, and in exchange, he agrees to introduce legislation and intervene with the State Department on behalf of the sheiks. 
All of this was caught on camera, by the way. Of the $50,000 he received, Myers kept $15,000 and the rest was divided among co-conspirators. Alright, who's next? Louis Johansson contacts Raymond Letterer and lets him know about the situation. For his help, Letterer just wants $5,000 in campaign contributions. On September 11th, Letterer meets with Arachetti, Amoroso, and Weinberg at a hotel near the JFK airport. Just like Myers, he wants the Sheiks to invest in his district. Letterer agrees to introduce legislation and is handed a paper bag containing $50,000. Again, his devious dealings were caught on camera. Of the $50,000, Letterer keeps $5,000. The rest is split amongst the agents, the lawyers, and of course, Mr. Arachetti. Later that month, Crichton recruits Frank Thompson, a Democratic congressman from New Jersey. Crichton and Thompson then meet with Weinberg and Amoroso, but unfortunately, Thompson doesn't accept a bribe. They meet again on October 9th and discuss the issue with the Sheiks. Thompson has apparently been won over. Because teamwork makes the dream work, Thompson says he'll recruit other congressmen for their cause. He also wants an investment in his district. Throughout the meeting, Thompson refuses to acknowledge that he's getting money, but does recognize that he's receiving a briefcase. At the end of the meeting, Amoroso hands a briefcase containing $50,000 to Crichton, who is accepting it on Thompson's behalf. Of the $50,000, Thompson receives $20,000 and the rest is divided. Thompson, staying true to his word, approaches John Murphy, a Democratic congressman from New York. Murphy's in. On October 20th, Murphy, Crichton, and Weinberg meet. Just like Thompson, Crichton accepts $50,000 concealed in a briefcase on Murphy's behalf. Murphy gets $15,000, Thompson gets $10,000, and the rest is divided by the others. The agents meet with Larry Pressler, a Republican senator from South Dakota. They say that they can quickly raise fifty dollars to $100,000 for his campaign if he helps them out. He turns down every opportunity. I don't have an image for this. I'm just adding it in right now. Um, when Abscam was revealed and everyone found out that Larry Pressler did not take a bribe, people called him a hero, and he, he did not approve of this, and he said it was incredibly sad how he was considered heroic for not taking a bribe. All right, yeah. Back to the... The, 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 the thing. In late October or early November, Thompson approaches John Murtha, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, on the floor of the House. Thompson tells him about wealthy Arab sheiks who need help with immigration. A week later, he comes to him again and says that the sheiks are offering $50,000 and that it'll be split between Murphy and the two of them. On December 4th, John Genrette meets with Weinberg, Stowe, and Amoroso. They agree that Jeanrette will introduce an immigration bill for $100,000 with a $50,000 down payment. Before sealing the deal, Jeanrette warns them. He really wants to help Abdul Enterprises, but he's actively under federal investigation, which will make it harder for him to hold his end of the bargain. He says that he'll know very soon whether the investigation will be pursued further, and that, if he's fine, he'll make the deal. He assures the agents that, despite his hesitancy, he still has larceny in his blood. He actually said that. On December 6th, he learns that he's in the clear and tells Weinberg that Stowe will pick up the money. Sure enough, Stowe swings by and collects the $50,000. Jenrette then calls the agents to let them know that he has received the payment. Remember William Rosenberg? He's back. He talks to a man named Stanley Weiss and asks if he knows any congressman that can help Abdul Enterprises. Weiss then talks to a man named Eugene Cusio about this. They both know a guy. Later, Cusio talks to Richard Kelly, a Republican congressman from Florida. Cusio tells him that he, Weitz, and Rosenberg will get paid a combined $25,000 for referring him. Even though he isn't going to receive any money, Kelly agrees. On January 7, 1980, John Murtha meets with Amoroso, Crichton, and Weinberg at a townhouse in Washington, D.C. The guys repeatedly offer him $50,000, but he turns it down every time. Murtha wants an investment in his district and nothing more. Towards the end of the meeting, the agents bring up Thompson and Murphy. Murtha assures them that they have the right guys for the job because they're dependable, but that the businessmen can't just go name-dropping like this. Murtha leaves, and Crichton and Amoroso argue about how the meeting was a failure. Crichton insists that he'll take the bribe eventually, but Amoroso says that it's over. They don't try again. The next day, Kelly and the gang arrive at the same house for a meeting. Amoroso pulls Kelly aside and talks with him privately about the impending deal. Kelly is happy to help the sheiks, and is perfectly fine with the sheiks giving money to his friends instead. All he wants is an investment in his district. Instead of giving money to the men directly, Amoroso insists that it's safer to give the money to Kelly instead because it avoids witnesses. 
Kelly is handed money, which he stuffs into his suit pockets. He asks Amoroso if the money is visible. Later in the month, Weinberg calls Crinan and tells him that the Sheiks want to build a hotel in Philadelphia and that they don't want legal issues to slow down the project. Crinan knows some guys who can help. Three men are recruited for this. The first is Louis Johansson, of course, who is paid $25,000. The second is Harry Giannotti, another city council member, who's paid $10,000. The third is George Schwartz, the president of the Philadelphia City Council. He's paid $30,000. Alright, this is getting a bit too expensive. Politicians are taking so much money that Operation Abskim has to be shut down. The FBI just can't afford it anymore. Also, somebody just leaked the operation to the media, so there's that. On February 2nd, the operation is revealed. It doesn't exactly help the nation's view of Congress. FBI agents arrive at the homes of several people who were involved and interrogate them. You can imagine the betrayal they felt when they realized that their new chic friends weren't real. Especially Harrison Williams, who thought he was going to make $12.6 million. Uh-oh. Who's on the FBI's naughty list? Oh, come on now. You guys know better. These public servants are in a lot of trouble, and the next year doesn't look too great for them. If you ever get elected to Congress or the Senate and you really want to be expelled for some reason, you need to get at least two-thirds of your coworkers to vote to kick you out. This can be quite difficult because you need to be naughty enough to have your own party agree that you need to go. To make things run a bit smoother, I'll talk about what happened to each guy individually instead of having a timeline. First up, Myers. Before he even got to run for re-election, he was expelled from Congress in October of 1980. He was the first congressman to be expelled since the Civil War. Only two other congressmen have met the same fate after him. Jim Traficant, another Democrat, was expelled in 2002 for 10 felonies. The other is George Santos, a Republican who was expelled in December of 2023 for... a, a lot of things. At trial, Myers claimed that he was just defrauding the Sheiks and had no real intention of actually following through with any of his promises. Money talked, but bullshit did not, in fact, walk as Myers had previously claimed. He was convicted of bribery, accepting a criminal gratuity, interstate travel for unlawful activity, and conspiracy. He was sentenced to three years in prison and was handed a $20,000 fine. He appealed his conviction twice and was rejected both times. Next up, Thompson and Murphy. Both of them ran for re-election in 1980 and they both lost somehow. Thompson resigned in December because he had a bit much on his plate, considering the whole federal investigation thing. During trial, they both claimed that they had no idea what was in their respective briefcases. Thompson was convicted of conspiracy, bribery, and receipt of an unlawful gratuity. Murphy was found guilty of conspiracy, receiving an unlawful gratuity, and conflict of interest. Notice the absence of a bribery conviction? Both the jury and the judge agreed that he just kind of took money and it didn't seem like he was going to genuinely work for the Sheiks. Both men were sentenced to three years in prison and were fined $20,000 each. Murphy appealed and lost, and Thompson appealed twice and lost both. Next up is Letterer. He ran for re-election in 1980 and actually won while he was being indicted on corruption charges. Congress did not approve of his epic win and voted to expel him in April of 1981. <laughs> like the absolute boss that he was, he resigned before they could kick him out. He ended up being convicted of conspiracy, bribery, interstate travel to aid in racketeering, and accepting an unlawful gratuity. He was sentenced to three years in prison and was ordered to pay $20,000 in fines. Kelly's up now. He was not given the party nomination, so he didn't even get a chance to be like Letterer. He claimed during trial that he was actually conducting his own investigation into Abdul Enterprises. Kelly, Weiss, and Cusio were all found guilty of conspiracy to commit bribery, bribery, and interstate travel to commit bribery. Kelly appealed, and he actually won. However, in 1983, Chief Judge Spotswood W. Robinson, Circuit Judge George E. McKinnon, and some other random circuit judge named Ruth Bader Ginsburg reinstated his conviction. He went to prison for 13 months. Next is Jinrette. Both he and Stowe were charged with one count of conspiracy to commit bribery and two counts of bribery. Alongside entrapment, of course, Jinrette's alcoholism was the basis of his defense. His heavy drinking impeded his judgment. This caused him to be overly paranoid about the men whom he believed to be mobsters, and he was scared about being harmed if he didn't go along with them. 
The jury believed that the evidence against Jenrette was strong enough and they found both him and Stowe guilty on all counts. Jenrette was sentenced to two years in prison along with five years of probation and a $20,000 fine. He ran for re-election, lost, and resigned in December before his term ended. Harrison Williams. Both he and Feinberg were charged with one count of bribery, two counts of conflict of interest, two counts of receiving a criminal gratuity, and two counts of interstate travel in aid of a racketeering enterprise. They, of course, claimed entrapment. That come on strong comment from Weinberg in the summertime was brought up as evidence. It did not work. Senator Williams was found guilty on all counts while Feinberg was guilty on all but one. They both received three years in prison. Williams was fined $50,000 while Feinberg was fined forty. Right before the Senate held a vote to expel him, Williams resigned. Before he left, though, he gave an emotional speech to his co-workers on how he did nothing wrong and that he was resigning so that the Senate wouldn't look bad for kicking him out for no reason. Now it's time for the council members. Gennady was sentenced to six months in prison and was handed a $2,000 fine. Schwartz got a $10,000 fine and was sentenced to a full year and an extra day because screw him, I guess. Finally, Arichetti and the gang. Cook sang during trial in exchange for immunity, which left Arichetti, Crichton, and Johansson open to punishment. Abskim wouldn't have been nearly as successful if it weren't for these honorable, noble gentlemen. What rewards did they receive for their help? Johansson ended up getting three years in prison and a $20,000 fine. Both Crichton and Arichetti got six years and fines totaling $40,000, the two harshest sentences out of everybody involved. Although the sting worked, it was extremely controversial in the public eye. Debates raged everywhere over the ethics of Abscam. Abscam was successful, but as an operation, it was kind of a mess. The Senate opened up an ethics committee investigation into it. They had several problems with the conduct of the FBI. First off, countless conversations just weren't recorded. Sometimes the transcripts of recorded conversations weren't accurate, and inaudible replaced pieces of transcripts that were clearly audible. There was also an incident where an agent set up a phone with recording devices before a Weinberg call but messed it up. The person on the other end wasn't recorded, which meant that the evidence was useless. Instead of wiping the tape, he just threw the entire thing away. When questioned on why he did this, the only explanation he offered was that he was embarrassed and angry that he messed up the recording. Weinberg also occasionally bought his own tapes to record with because the FBI didn't give him enough. He alleged that in January of 1980, several tapes had been stolen from his luggage at the airport. There were also claims that the FBI didn't supervise Weinberg enough, and this was partially evidenced by his criminal past and incidents like on June 28th. The committee also thought that it was kind of ridiculous how Senator Williams was offered $12.6 million while everyone else got thousands. They concluded that while the FBI messed up quite badly throughout the operation, it wasn't enough to invalidate their findings. These guys took bribes. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. That's Abscam for you. Is there anything we can learn from this interesting piece of American political history? Absolutely. Always remember, public service is like a sandwich. No matter which way you flip it, the bread always comes first. And you can quote me on that. Thank you for watching, and please don't attempt to bribe your local government officials. See ya.